Police in Quebec City charge a French-Canadian university student with murder following a deadly attack on a mosque in the city. Controversy and challenges over the U.S. government's temporary travel ban for people from seven countries. And U.N. experts say African countries can experience an economic boom if the continent's youth remain healthy and contribute to their country's development. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. U.S. President Donald Trump wasted no time Monday night in firing an acting attorney general who earlier in the day ordered the Justice Department not to defend his executive order temporarily banning travel, uh, travelers from seven mostly Muslim countries. The White House statement said Sally Yates betrayed the Department of Justice by refusing to enforce a legal order designed to protect the citizens of the United States. Yates wrote a letter to Justice Department lawyers earlier Monday saying she was not convinced the president's order was lawful. The White House statement denounced Yates as a weak on borders and very weak on illegal immigration. Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal praised Yates' actions hours after her dismissal. And I want to salute Sally Yates, who has taken a stand based on moral and legal principle in the highest tradition of the Department of Justice, saying that these orders cannot be defended, that the rule of law and morality is more important than the politics of the moment, and the impulsive edicts of a ruler who apparently fails to understand that law, or at least his administration does. Well, then President Barack Obama appointed Yates to be Deputy Attorney General early in 2015. She was asked to stay on by the Trump administration until a new Attorney General is confirmed by the Senate. Dana Bente, a U.S. prosecutor based in the eastern state of Virginia, was named to replace Yates as acting Attorney General. The executive order issued by President Trump led to a weekend of confusion, particularly at the nation's airports, where in some cases, People holding green cards as permanent legal residents were detained for extra questioning before being allowed entry. Now, the controversy over the U.S. government's temporary travel ban for people from seven majority Muslim countries continues with individuals, groups, and entire nations reacting against the policy. The White House on Monday defended the move as essential to secure the safety of Americans and as a minor inconvenience for travelers from the affected nations. VOA's Larry Zahok reports. Somali-born Minnesota resident Farhan Anshur was relieved when his wife and children were eventually allowed to join him after being detained at an airport near Washington, D.C. Finally, we are here together. We, no, nobody's missing from me right now. I have all my family together with me right now, so I'm happy with that. The 90-day travel ban affects citizens of Iraq, Syria, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Somalia and Yemen. Passport holders from these countries were not allowed to board U.S.-bound flights after the ban was enacted Friday night, and those who were already en route were temporarily detained on arrival. The White House apologized for what it described as a temporary inconvenience, but the ban will have other implications, says a former Somali presidential candidate. I was supposed to be um, at a panel in the Harvard Business School, and also at the Harvard um, Kennedy School. Mm, but I will not be able to go there because of this um, travel ban. Fadumo Daib, a dual Somali and Finnish citizen, says she is more worried about Somali refugees in Kenya designated for resettlement in the United States. And to have that kind of opportunity snatched away from them just because they happen to be Muslims or they happen to come from a country that is not um, you know, by, by choice. A U.S. Muslim advocacy group says it will challenge the order in the courts. This lawsuit is a broad constitutional challenge, and it was filed on behalf of o over 20 uh, Muslims 
consisting of both Americans and non-citizens that are lawfully residing in the United States. The ban has a Swedish-Iranian actress concerned that she may not be able to attend this year's Academy Awards ceremony. Bahar Paris plays one of the leads in the Oscar-nominated film A Man Called Uva, and an Iranian-British composer is unsure if she will attend the premiere of her opera in Pittsburgh in April. It's definitely made me question um, my relationship with America and how to deal with that in the future. Critics say the ban will have a lot more negative consequences without boosting U.S. security as intended. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, the ban on travelers from seven predominantly Muslim countries has European governments scrambling to respond to the measure. The ban presents a major dilemma for these governments under pressure by their growing Muslim populations on one side and on the other, rising nationalist sentiments among those who oppose further Muslim immigration. VOS Luis Ramirez reports. A honeymoon interrupted. Theresa May had a successful visit with U.S. President Donald Trump and got him to say he supports NATO. But a firestorm awaited her after her Washington visit. May faces angry criticism from the left for not coming out strongly enough against Trump's ban. My message as the mayor of London is loud and clear. I think the ban is cruel and shameful, and our prime minister should not be condoning it. Trump's action is prompting soul-searching among governments across Europe. Welcoming refugees who flee war and oppression is part of our duty. We must ensure it happens in a fair, correct way and also in solidarity, and ensuring the way we do it. That's why European dialogue and European solidarity must continue to play a role, so that societies are not unsettled, but that they fulfill their commitments and that they are faithful to our values. This battle of values pits those who champion multiculturalism and humanitarianism against those who see national culture and identity in danger. This is a, a difficult situation for many Western European nations, a Muslim minority community that's growing in the light of various aspects of their demographics uh, relative to populations, uh, majority populations who are not reproducing as fast. So there's a, a certain visibility and heightened awareness that is often loaded in negative terms. The Trump administration says its policy is similar to what President Obama did in 2011 when he banned visas for refugees from Iraq for six months. The seven countries named in Trump's executive order are the same countries previously identified by the Obama administration as sources of terror. This new policy intervention is a continuation of the past, but what is problematic about it is it's how it's come about i.e. in the first week or so when lots of other initiatives from uh, the Trump administration have raised eyebrows and where there is a, a climate uh, out there where a sense of uh, um, uh, a feeling towards the refugees is, is significant and uh, various liberal left sectors of society are in, um, are in a state of, sort of outcry. While protests against Trump's ban are getting bigger and louder, Voters who quietly sympathize with nationalist movements have leaders in Europe worried and acting carefully. What they say and how they say it could mean big losses as several countries go to the polls this year. Luis Ramirez, VOA News, London. Well, since his inauguration on January 20th, President Donald Trump has moved quickly to deliver on his agenda of change. He has signed several executive orders aimed at jump-starting key parts of his domestic and foreign policy priorities. Here's viewers Jim Malone. Donald Trump's first days in office have been a whirlwind, a, a flurry of executive orders on trade, cutting government regulations, and, most controversially, tightening immigration. We had to make the move, or we decided to make the move. But Trump's temporary immigration ban on seven predominantly Muslim countries sparked a backlash at home and abroad, leading to chaos at U.S. airports and protests in the streets. Democrats were quick to denounce the order, including Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer. It was implemented in a way that created chaos and confusion across the country, and it will only serve to embolden and inspire those around the globe who will do us harm. Trump says the flurry of executive actions is aimed at delivering on his campaign promises. 
We're here now because tens of millions of Americans have placed their hopes in us to transfer power from Washington, D.C. and give it back to the people. But there have been distractions as well. Trump's habit of issuing statements through Twitter and his preoccupation with the size of his inaugural crowds present challenges. House Speaker Paul Ryan. And, and I, think, I think we're going to see um, unconventional activities like tweets and things like that. And I think that's just something that we're all going to have to get used to. Trump has also called for a probe into possible voter fraud based on his claim, offered without proof, that he lost the popular vote because millions of illegal immigrants voted for Hillary Clinton. It's a distraction that could become a liability for implementing his agenda, says analyst John Fortier. And on big things like changing Obamacare, uh, on tax cuts, on regulatory things, uh, Donald Trump was still emphasizing uh, border security and building the wall. Those are things that I think they will try to act relatively quickly on and use those majorities before the momentum of the early part of the administration fades away. Other experts say Trump should consider trying to broaden his support beyond his core supporters. Brookings Institution analyst John Hudak. 2.8 million or 2.9 million more people voted for Hillary Clinton. It's not to say that his presidency is illegitimate. It's not. But it is to say that he has a lot of work to do to convince the American public that he represents and reflects the values of a majority of them. But for now, Trump seems determined to follow through on the campaign pledges he made to his core supporters, no matter the intensity of the political pushback. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Police in Quebec City, Canada, have charged a French-Canadian university student with murder following a deadly attack on a mosque. 27-year-old Alexander Bessonet was charged Monday evening with six counts of first-degree murder and five counts of attempted murder in the shooting. Eight people were wounded in the attack at the Quebec Islamic Cultural Centre late Sunday. Five of the wounded are in critical condition. Speaking to Parliament Monday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the victims were targets, targeted because uh, of their religion. To the more than one million Canadians who profess the Muslim faith, I want to say directly, we are with you. 36 million hearts are breaking with yours. And know that we value you. You enrich our shared country in immeasurable ways. It is your home. Well, a second person was detained by police as a suspect, but is now being considered a witness. Police did not give a motive for the attack, and it is not clear if anyone else was involved in the shooting. Prime Minister Trudeau's office said U.S. President Donald Trump called Monday to offer his condolences and to provide any assistance needed. The African Union admitted Morocco as a member on Tuesday, more than three decades after Rabat withdrew from the bloc's predecessor of a row about the status of Western Sahara. The North African nation quit the AU's predecessor, the Organization of African Unity, after the body recognized Western Sahara, most of which has been controlled by Morocco since 1976. Morocco claimed the territory after Spain's exit and fought a 16-year war, war with the Polisario independence movement that established the self-declared Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, with support initially from Algeria and then from across Africa. Morocco's King Mohammed V, uh, the sixth, took his seat for the first time in the AU headquarters, one of the few international fora to recognize a rival Western Sahara. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Coming up, UN experts say African countries can experience an economic boom if the continent's youth remain or rather contribute to their community's development and if they remain healthy. Stay with us. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. 
And our correspondents will do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. Well, it's time for our health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Madu with some new information on sleep and our immune system. Lino. And that's right, Vincent. A new study says not getting enough sleep can make you sick. Writing in the journal Sleep, researchers from the University of Washington say sleep deprivation depresses the body's immune system. To reach their conclusions, the researchers studied 11 pairs of identical twins with differing sleep patterns and found that the twin who slept less had a depressed immune system. Researchers noted that genetics account for 31 and 55% of sleep duration with behavior and environmental making up the rest. They say existing data on limited sleep deprivation in a lab setting can increase inflammatory markers and activate immune cells, but that less is known about long-term sleep deprivation in natural conditions. And now the World Health Organization says tobacco control policies not only saves lives, but also could generate significant government revenues for health and development work. In a report released recently, the WHO says there are about 1.1 billion smokers aged 15 and up, and around 80% live in low and middle income countries, with 226 million living in poverty. The almost 700-page document was produced in collaboration with the U.S. National Cancer Institute. Medical experts say smoking can cause diseases such as lung cancer and heart disease. Tobacco products cost the world's economies more than $1 trillion annually in healthcare expenditures and lost productivity and kills some 6 million people each year. This uh, monograph on tobacco control economics is sin significant in two ways. From a public health uh, standpoint, uh, tobacco use kills 6 million people every year. But from an economic standpoint, the cost to, of tobacco use is more than $1 trillion uh, every year for uh, lost productivity and health care expenditures. Tobacco control measures can easily be implemented in low and middle income countries because they're very cost effective. Uh, these measures include significant uh, tax and price increases, uh, marketing bans on tobacco industry marketing, uh, smoke-free uh, policies, pictorial warnings, and the like. And the WHO's head of Tobacco Control Economics Unit adds that the monograph on tobacco control and economics can be used by governments to ramp up tobacco control. Now, the demographic dividend is listed as a top priority at the ongoing African Union Summit. UN experts say over 30% of Africa's population is comprised of young people, which is considered an asset for the continent. Observers say when the number of working age people surpasses the number of dependents, African countries can experience an economic boom, a demographic dividend. VOA's Khalil Gay reports on how this is being addressed in Mali. In the wings of the Africa France Bamako summit, the Malian Ministry of Youth has invited some 20 African youth ministers to discuss ways of achieving a demographic dividend. The meeting, co organized with the Mali Office of UNFPA, started with a fully attended workshop on strengthening the knowledge of youth and adolescents on sexual and reproductive health. If you don't take care of your youth, who will be the leader tomorrow? If we have a chance to be where we are, because we had a chance to be educated, we had a chance to have some opportunities, and that's what we have to put in our children and uh, the other children to really have the capital of human capital in front of the agenda. Access to health and reproductive services, ending child marriage, early pregnancies, sexual violence and female genital mutilation set the scene for the local arm of UNFPA whose philosophy is to invest in Africa's youth in order to make them the actors of their own change. I feel that this movement that has begun can also impact positively on other countries and other regions 
um, that are also looking to, to, to harness the demographic dividend with, with youth. The host of the meeting, the Malian Minister of Youth, urged efforts to help achieve a demographic dividend with a healthy youth. Mr. Mabingengom, UNFPA Regional Director for West and Central Africa, went even further. High population growth can be a threat to peace, security and stability. I also believe that high population growth will make weak or fragile governments, fragile state, even more fragile. So I think there is a case for population growth to be taken much more seriously, and there is a case for population growth to not be seen as a development issue, but also as an instrument for building residence. So, an emerging Africa will remain but a dream if the lowering of fertility is not accelerated, and that will necessarily require significant investment in the sexual health of youth and adolescents. The youth in Mali is well aware of their position on the road to the demographic dividend, and that's why they're asking to be fully involved in decision-making. Khalil Gay for VOA News, Bamako. That's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lina Ahmoudou. Vincent? Good to see Khalil doing his uh, uh, signature stand up there. Thanks a lot, Lina. I'll be sure to watch Lina Ahmoudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Now we have an important programming note. Next week, we present a powerful four part series on Boko Haram. From its base in northern Nigeria, the terrorist organization has targeted Muslims and Christians alike. Since 2009, it has killed more than 20,000 people. Boko Haram members hide behind masks. But now, VOA has exclusively obtained secret videos shot by Boko Haram that identify operatives committing acts of terror and which reveal a power struggle among the group's leaders. The series focus is brutal, the brutal and violent impact the group has on men, women and children and its control. It's not for the faint of heart, but it is a story that needs to be told. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a Nigerian-born designer stirs up a fashion buzz in Washington, D.C. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Maria Magiallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Ethiopia, Morocco's King Mohammed VI arrives at the African Union headquarters for the first time in 33 years. We stay in Ethiopia where outgoing AU head Nkosasana Dlamini Zuma says that U.S. travel banned on seven Muslim-majority countries, including three in Africa, heralds turbulent times for the continent. In Niger, the northern city of Agadez, a migrant smuggling hub empties after a European Union cracked down. Finally, in South Africa, prosecutor Jerry Nell, who came to worldwide attention for securing the murder conviction of Olympic sprinter Oscar Pistorius, has resigned. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back. American-based Nigerian-born designer Vivian Agbakoba launched a clothing line, Anya, by Vivian in 2013. Since then, she has stirred up quite a buzz on the fashion scene here in Washington, D.C. And now women in the U.S. Capitol who like to shop but are worried about what to wear are getting a custom-made shopping experience right at their doorsteps. Tuna designer Vivian Abakoba has always been a fashion fanatic. By the age of 11, she started to experiment with beautiful fabrics and taught herself the art of designing clothes. 
Today, she is the founder and artistic director of her own label, Anya by Vivian, derived from her media name, Anya, which in the Igbo language means eyes or vision. For me, beauty is in everyone. I see beauty in every woman, in every man, and a lot of times that's what inspires me. Aba Kobas' creative designs blend a mix of vibrant African prints and high-quality fabrics are produced by the Velisco brand to create a dazzling array of outfits. When I see the fabric, um, I try to figure out which one would work with the concept I have. But sometimes I'm also inspired by these beautiful prints that I see. They are so vibrant and colorful. Vivian Abakoba has participated in several fashion shows, showcasing innovative, unique and cutting-edge fashion designs and wants to make a difference in the diaspora. Taylor Nkencha, one of Vivian's clients, says she manages to maintain the eccentric romantic feel of the garment. This is a fabulous dress that I'm wearing by Anya by Vivian. Um, very sophisticated. Um, I've actually worn it to um, a dinner with my husband. and It was just unbelievable. Nina Oranusi, another client, says that the day she wore this outfit, people were blown away because of its uniqueness. Her tailoring is neat, the threading is neat, everything's in details. The cutting, the layout, everything is just placed together. And that's what I like about what she does. Oman Gwabia notes that her Vivian's ability to design with a variety of prints has given her a limitless opportunity to continue to unleash her creativity and grow her client base. She goes for a good quality fashion and she believes in fashion um, in, you know, like using fashion to bring out the best in people. Abakoba attributes her success to her parents who pushed her to pursue her dream in the fashion industry. My dad, who was a, was a professor, um, he did kind of see that I had this gift. My mom encouraged it by allowing me to use her machines and leftover fabrics that she worked with, and she taught me a few of the stuff that I knew. But my dad was exceptionally very supportive. Phil Russell, a manager at Sona African Textiles, says Vivian has tremendous potential to meet the growing demand for high-end products in the global market, including Africa's growing middle class. She typically buys the Velisco. Uh -huh. um, she, they have wax block, super wax, Java, uh, and the way I would differentiate those three products mm -hmm. is typically uh, if you think of um, bedding you know thread count mm -hmm. you know the higher the thread count the better the quality as the Anya by Vivian's label expands and makes its marker in the fashion world Abakoba says uh, she will play a significant role in inspiring the next generation of young designers Paul Ndiho VOA News Washington and that's our show. Have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. This word deals with legal issues and travel extradited. Security officials say many young militants are inspired by Muslim cleric Abu Qatadab, who was extradited from Britain last year. Jordan's postponed his trial on charges of plotting to attack tourists at New Year celebrations in 2000, but previously convicted him for conspiring to attack U.S. targets in Jordan. Extradited means to move a prisoner between two countries. Sometimes a person commits a crime in one country, and escapes to another. If the person is found, police can send him back to the country where he committed the crime, and he could face a trial. Now, when you hear the word extradited, you will know what this news word means.